Well, we said this was going to act like a base. Mm -hmm. Well, what do bases do? Uh, bases, uh, they're going to lose electrons and they're going to gain a proton. That's right. Let's focus on that gaining the proton idea. Now, where is it going to take the proton from? Well, it turns out that in an elimination reaction, we take the proton, that's right, from the beta carbon. Now, there's three different beta carbons here, but they're all symmetrical, so it doesn't matter which one you choose. So we can just draw in one. I'll label this one to show that I'm treating this as the beta carbon. And then this turned out to be a kind of a complicated mechanism. At the same time that we take this beta hydrogen, well, now we have to figure out what to do with these electrons. These electrons are going to be free when we take that hydrogen. Well, those electrons can move down here. However, that means we have to make room for those new electrons here on the number two carbon. Mm -hmm. Well, we can do that by having the leaving group leave. All right. That's why this was called the alpha carbon in the first place, because it has a leaving group. Okay. Well, now that we've drawn all the arrows, remember that we should be definitely able to draw the products. Once you have the arrows, it should be easy to draw the products as long as we take our time. So let's draw the products. Good. I was saying it should be easy to get the products if we go one atom at a time. Mm -hmm. For example, here, we could start with the number one carbon. Who's the number one attached to? The number two. Who's the number two attached to? Well, we can see that it's attached to the number four. Mm -hmm. We can see that it's attached to the number three. Mm -hmm. But obeying this arrow, we can see there should be a new pi bond in between the two and the three. And you drew that. And this hydrogen is broken off. Where has the hydrogen gone? Well, the hydrogen is now attached to this oxygen. Mm -hmm. And the chloride is left, which we can draw like this. So we got our three different products. What type of functional group is this? Is this an ether? No. Do you remember what the name of this type of functional group is with a carbon-carbon pi bond? Carbon-carbon double bond? What do we call a functional group with a carbon-carbon double bond? I think this was maybe the main type of functional group that you focused on last term. Alkene. This is an alkene. Yeah. Well, then this would, so would this be a good way to make an ether? No. no. This is maybe a good way to make an alkene. Now, we had a little detour here because we were trying to review what happens with acids and bases. But the main purpose of going through these examples here is when you first look at this, both of these seem like ways to make ethers. Mm -hmm. On first glance, both of these seem like ways to make ethers. However, this one doesn't work as a Williams ether synthesis because we get the E2 instead. The big lesson then from this example is we know that a Williams ether synthesis occurs with, between an alkyl oxide and a halo alkane. However, you have to make sure there's not too much steric hindrance. Mm -hmm. If there's too much steric hindrance, you're going to get E2 instead, and then you'll get an alkene. In particular, this doesn't work for tertiary haloalkanes. Okay. Williams and ether synthesis doesn't work for tertiary haloalkanes. That's what went wrong here. This was tertiary. That's something that we shouldn't really quite have to memorize. That should be clear from our table. Sure. Because a tertiary haloalkane can't do SN2. It can only do E2. But we need SN2 for the Williams and ether synthesis. OK?
something your instructor wants you to be able to do with this reaction is retrosynthesis. Okay. For example, they want us to be able to retrosynthesize this molecule here. Right. We need to understand then what this type of arrow means. Now this is different from the arrows that we've been using in the past. Normally we've been using these types of yield arrows. When we use this type of yield arrow, what do we put on the left? The starting material or the product? Starting material. Right. And on the right, we put the product. All that these retrosynthesis arrows mean is that they've just reversed the positions of the starting material and the product. Okay. When you use one of these retrosynthesis arrows, it just means that the species on the left is the, start is the product. And what we write on the right will be the starting material. All right. All retrosynthesis means is they want us to work backwards from the product. They want us to figure out some starting materials that we could use to make the product. I find these retrosynthesis arrows very confusing, though, because we've been spending all this time with the starting materials on the left and the products on the right. I find it very confusing to suddenly start having the products on the left and the starting material on the right. So whenever I'm doing a retrosynthesis problem like this, anytime I'm given a retrosynthesis arrow, I always rewrite the problem with a normal arrow. And I would encourage you to do that as well. For a beginning student, it's better to avoid using these arrows because they're confusing, because they flip the normal ordering of the starting material and the product. So if this was the question, I would start by writing it like this. rewrite the problem like this with the product on the right hand side of a normal arrow, just because that's less confusing, that's easier to think about. I'd recommend that you should always do that. Even if the problem introduces a retrosynthesis arrow, it'll be much clearer for us if we just put the product on the right hand side of a regular arrow. And now we can see what they're trying to ask us to do. They're asking us just for what are the starting materials that would lead to this product. Mm -hmm. Well, let's try to do that problem. Let's ask ourselves what starting materials would lead to this product. Well, what type of functional group is this? It's, a, uh, it's an ether. That's right. Well, we've learned one way to make ethers. What, what starting materials do we need to make an ether? Um, we need uh, alkoxide and uh, halon. I'll put in some numbers here. Remember, the numbers don't, you wouldn't, don't have to use the same exact numbers because these are not IAPAC numbers. They're just whatever numbers are convenient. Now, we need to put some squiggles in here. We need to squiggle a bond that m might have been formed here. Squiggle a bond that might have been formed in doing this Williamson ether synthesis. All right. Well, to start with the alk oxide, here's our alk oxide, say. This one over here. Yeah. Okay. So, do you think that the number five was originally in the alk oxide or was it originally in the halo alkane? Halo alkane. Okay. So, we would write that like this. Well, let's see if we can write the alk oxide and halo alkane that would correspond to this squiggle then. All right.
That seems right. Good. 